uh, calling the Sunderland Elementary School Committee meeting to order at uh, 5.04. Uh, and the first item on the agenda is reorganization. And uh, maybe we can get a, a motion to table that until we're a core or until we have all members present. So moved. All right. Second. Second. Uh, any discussion? Oh, uh, all in favor, let's see. Jessica? Yes. Maisie? Yes. Peter? Yes. Greg? Yes. Okay. So <laughs> on with that for now. Um, let's see. On to review and approve the minutes of August 13th and August 20th. Uh, I had one minor correction um, on August 14th, page four in the lower half. Uh, it says that Darius was surveying teachers about their plans to return, but I, I think he was only collecting requests for accommodations and leaves at that point. I don't think he was getting confirmations of who would definitely return. And I think we should just have that be accurately reflected. Um, Page four, second half. It's the first line of a paragraph. Uh, just give me a moment while I try and find it here. Which date was that? We got uh, August 14th. Okay, and how do you think it should read? Oh, sorry, I don't have it open. Yeah, it's, I'm just... I think we should say something like Darius has been collecting, has been collecting accommodation and leave requests instead of saying he surveyed. Okay, tell me again, what, which was this for the, for the 13th? Yep. Okie doke. Okay, so I got Mr. Modesto responded that he had surveyed teachers as to their willingness to return to the building. And what are you suggesting, Jessica? Uh, Darius responded that he had been collecting accommodation and leave requests from staff. Does that sound accurate, Darius? Darius was nodding before. <laughs> I'm hearing you. Yes, at that particular time, there was no more serving. You're right. I was collecting at that point. So, it was like July, I was serving. Accommodation and leave requests, period. Yeah. Is that all right, Jessica? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. You want to make a motion? I guess you probably need to. Do we need to make a motion for that amendment? Yeah, a motion to accept the meeting, uh, the uh, minutes with the amendment. I move to accept the minutes with, with the amendment. Okay. Outstanding. All second? Any discussion? Further discussion? All right, uh, let's see. Peter? Yes. Uh, Jessica? Yes. Maisie? Yes. And Greg, yes. Okay. All right, now we've got the financial statements and the signing of the warrants. Okay, so I emailed a report out yesterday um, and I'm gonna go over that quickly. I don't think that there's as much to discuss this month, but certainly some points that I wanna highlight for you. Um, so first of all, there were 12 warrants totaling $62,993.93 that were reviewed and signed electronically. Thank you for that. Um, I hope that process is going well. I'm certainly happy to take feedback from you if it's not. Uh, so for financial update, I did share the general fund and school choice reports. I'm happy to take individual questions about those if you have line items that you're interested in inquiring about. Um, otherwise, I'll move ahead with a quick update. Um, so you'll see on the general fund, it's it's not as easy to pinpoint as it is on the school choice report, but the school choice report does have some COVID related expenditures. Um, before we had the grant set up, we needed to pay for some things out of some line item. So I went ahead and set up that grant, uh, that COVID relief in the school choice fund. So we may reallocate some of that depending on um, Ben's additional needs at the school. The idea is to use any grant funding first. Um, so that will be the goal. So we'll likely see some of those COVID expenses that are on school choice move off as we continue to assess our needs going back to school. 
Um, and then we've also had some significant expenses outside of you know, some basic supplies for COVID related to get school back going again, um, particularly with the HVAC and ventilation repairs that were needed in order for the building to be safe for students and staff to return. Um, also, custodial supplies have increased, and obviously, PPE, making sure that we have enough personal protective equipment for all of our staff. Um, so, Peter had asked a, a question to me via email. He sent, sent some through. I'm going to kind of answer them here as I go. Um, one of your comments was uh, whether or not I was concerned about the general fund at this point, given these expenditures. And also, um, I made a statement in my report about the possibility of needing to increase and hire additional staffing because of the educational model. Um, there was this question, I think, when we were going into this over the summer, and as you'll recall, we really didn't talk about the budget in making a decision about which model to go with because we wanted the needs of the students um, and the staff to be put first as part of that decision-making process. Um, but there was a question as to what model would be more cost-effective or what would be more costly for the school. Um, and the hybrid model is certainly turning out to be a model of education that is not showing a lot of area for savings as we had originally thought it would. Um, staffing is certainly a challenge, uh, I think partially because we have some folks that we've granted accommodations for to work remotely whether it was ADA accommodations or we just made an exception to policy. Um, you know, and then we also have students that are living, whether it's fully remote or they're gonna be starting hybrid. So making sure that we have adequate class coverage for students in the building as well as students that are on remote. So I think Ben is still in the process of all, moving all the pieces around, um, but I, I think so far my conversations and understanding of it is, He's doing everything he can to utilize the resources of the existing staff, but there certainly may become a point where, you know, once we have kids back in the building, we might need to reassess that and think about, you know, do we need another IA or, you know, something along those lines. Also, um, substitute coverage for all areas, nursing, teaching, and custodial are a big point of concern. Um, first of all, who is going to sub? You know, there's not a big pool out there right now. It's it's always been something that districts struggle with, and I don't think it's just particular to us. I think it's, you know, across the state that it's hard to find good subs. Um, and now we want to make sure that the subs we have coming in, you know, we're not exposing them and our, our populations not being exposed to any other additional risk with COVID. Um, and then, you know, if, if a school only has one or two custodians and that custodian ends up being very sick, how do we handle that for the long term? Sorry. So that gives me, <laughs> while Shelly's dogs bark, I think it gives me a chance to just to plug. I plugged the other meetings, you know, for those watching, we are we are looking for substitutes for the school year. We are very flexible on which days substitutes can work. So um, if you have any interest in subbing, please contact. You can start by contacting the building principal or contact central office. Um, for that, we are also looking for substitute nurses and substitute custodians. Again, if you're looking, someone's looking to pick up a few extra hours, or you may know somebody who wants to kind of even give to the community, so to speak, in a time of need, um, they will be paid, um, even the, even in this giving. But um, I just want to throw that out there because we did we did post in the paper. There's a large amount of unemployment in the state of Massachusetts, but not many people picking up jobs. So, um, you know, word of mouth is always our best chance of hire. So, feel free to mention it to people who might be interested. Thank you. So, um, Peter, to directly answer your question, you know, I, I'm not yet concerned, but I certainly have this on my radar because um, if we don't have savings, as you also mentioned in your email asking, are there areas that savings are possible? If we don't see them, you know, it's certainly something we're going to have to talk about of how we fund any additional staffing, whether it's substitute coverage or otherwise a permanent um, temporary position for this school year. So, you know, I think there have been some savings already. I'm going to talk about one of the savings opportunities and how we utilize those funds when we talk about early childhood. But there's been some staffing shifts. You know, Ben has had some people resign. And so when you hire on new people, there's always that chance of 
the new hire comes in high or the new hire comes in low on the salary scale. And so we have had some instances where there have been savings in salaries because of the replacements that have come in. So we'll be looking for those kind of opportunities. Um, we'll also be looking at regular overhead costs, regular supply costs. Although, you know, I got to tell you, my gut is that there's not going to be a lot of savings in regular line items because even though we're in this sort of strange model of kids being in multiple places and maybe not all of them being at school, we have staff at school five days a week. So, you know, we're still serving lunches five days a week. We still have administrative staff in the building, support staff. So there's a lot of things that aren't necessarily going to change. So I'm keeping a very close eye on it. Um, and, and month to month, I'll be giving you, you know, much more detailed updates if I certainly become concerned about something. No, I, I would just, my reaction, my sort of gut reaction after reading the letter of yours was that, uh-oh, we got things, we, it's time to start worrying about how we're going to make the numbers work for this year. And if that was something that was, you know, there was concrete stuff that we were going to be in a, in a big budget hole or something like that, then I would raise the question of, well, is there time that we, you know, let other people in town know that, hey, we've got a specific problem. But it sounds to me like we don't have a specific problem, but we just have a general concern that, you know, this is a this is a new area for a lot of this stuff. And we are, you know, concerned that things will keep popping up that will have to be dealt with. And, um, and that's not foreclosing the fact that, you know, a few months from now, we may find out, yeah, we do have a big problem. I don't know. It just... I, yeah, I, that's that's exactly right. To, to, to what you had said and seeing if that was, you know, in line with what you were thinking. Yep, I think your your interpretation of my report is exactly right. I think there are things on my radar that I want you to be aware of, so that if in a month or two months from now, Ben is saying we need a position and we can't wait for it, that we will have to talk about some of those. And you know, I I think staffing is one of the areas that that's certainly a concern. Um, not not immediate today, but just want to keep it at the forefront as we're looking ahead. Um, I, I think FY21, and I know I said this last month too, 21 is not even really our issue. Like 22 is really going to be where, okay, we're in a budget problem and and what how are we going to solve that problem? Um, so a couple more things here before I, I wrap up and see if you have any further questions. So in my report, I had said that the Revolving a fund was further analyzed for early childhood programs since we last met. Matt, things are moving so rapidly and changing so rapidly on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I think I had told you there was gonna be 11 or $12,000 in revenue for early childhood. We're coming in at about 8,000 right now. I think we're down one or two students that would have been tuition paying in that program. I haven't had a chance to connect with the early childhood director yet to, to get more budget information. But just looking at what I know currently, revenue's down slightly from when we last talked. Um, the fund does have about $45,000 in it. However, expenditures, which is primarily salaries and wages, are about 67,000. So with paying all of our existing expenses out of this account, we would have been looking at a projection at the end of the year of negative 15,000. Obviously, we can't run a fund into a negative balance. So uh, this was an immediate point of concern. And I made the decision to move some wages off of early childhood onto the general fund. Um, it was about $25,000 in salaries. And we had some savings, as I said earlier, in the general fund because of a position change. Somebody um, rehired or new hire was a lower step than the, the person that they replaced. So thankfully, that was an easy decision to make, really. And um, I felt fortunate that we had those funds available and we didn't have to dip into school choice or other resources. Um, so what that will do is leave about $10,000 positive in the account at the end of the year, assuming that the revenue comes in that we have it anticipated right now and we don't lose any more students that are tuition paying. Um, you know, that $10,000, it can be used towards support for next year's budget for early childhood, or there may be other things that we have to reallocate funds for, but I didn't want to wait and let us go in the hole for $15,000 for this year. Um, 
So I think that answers your question or your comment, Peter, about the early childhood program there. And Shelley, if um, yeah. if the pandemic forces the, the school to close for any period of time, would that also impact the early childhood income? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, definitely. What we had done in the spring was not charge families for remote learning days. So that's something that we would potentially have to reconsider. Um, so the last point that I want to make, and, and this is, again, an, another area of concern, these two things I, I have been most concerned about over general fund or anything else, even with the extra HVAC spending that we've had to do, early childhood, and then the school lunch program is, is areas where we have to keep a very close eye on. Um, the great news for our community is that the USDA extended the waiver to allow everyone to get free breakfast and lunch at school if they would like it. Um, which is excellent for our community. A lot of people need that right now. Uh, the challenging part for us is that we are a revenue-based program there. We try to support salaries and wages on the revenue that we have coming in for school lunch sales. So we have no idea at this point the volume of meals we're going to be serving. Um, so I can't even estimate what our reimbursement would be from the federal government. There will be some reimbursement, but I don't expect that we will be able to cover the wages that are due to be paid this year. Um, reimbursement is only on meals served, so it's not on the opportunity. You know, if we had 100 kids in the school and we only serve 50 meals, we request reimbursement on those 50 meals that we served, not on the population. Uh, so we have 21,000 in the revolving fund account right now. Um, and I see I have a typo in this. Peter, I'll fix that for you so when you do the report, you have the right number. Um, but we have 52,000 in wages planned as it stands right now. Um, I'm not yet sure if we're gonna have to reduce our staffing of our cafeteria staff. If we did, obviously that number would decrease. Um, we're still trying to figure out how this is all gonna work. We have meals to provide um, for families to pick up. We have meals to provide in school. And so uh, we're still assessing that and I'm in close communication with um, the food service director to make sure that the needs are being met and that we're being cautious with the amount of time that people are working. She understands the challenge that we're facing. And at the same time, we want to take care of people as much as we possibly can. So this is certainly an area of more immediate concern. Um, I haven't made any moves yet as far as moving staffing off of this fund onto general fund. Uh, I would like to see what the revenue looks like in the first six to eight weeks of school so that I can get a better projection. We have plenty of time. It's not something that we have to correct this second, um, but we will likely have to come up with another revenue source to pay, if not all, at least some of the staffing here. And then again, FY22, if we do not have a large surplus uh, remaining at the end of the year, how are we gonna continue to pay those staff going into another year? Um, I think that was your last concern, Peter, and I think I answered that there. Thank you. Right. Yeah, no problem. I'm happy to take other questions if you guys have them. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to add was that you'd ask, you, we've been doing the shining of the warrants uh, electronically, and you were just wondering how that was working out. And I'll just say from my point of view, it's wonderful, because instead of getting them dumped on a table during a school meeting, you want to... You got a choice. You want to pay attention to the meeting or you want to actually read the stuff that we're shining about bills being paid. And, you know, what happens is you don't really read the warrants. And now I get them and I can actually spend I'll go through them and see what we're spending money on. And it's, you know, it's not like we find anything wrong. It's just that it's a good education about what goes on at the school in terms of, of how we spend our money. So I think it's one. I really like what you've set up here. Good. I'm, I'm glad that's working well. I see a couple of people nodding their heads. I think maybe they're finding the same thing. It's it's much better. Yeah, I'd only add to that that uh, initially I, I would like go to the link, but I'm finding it's even more helpful if you can download it and sign from the downloaded copy. Uh, and it's still a little bit easier to do like the full page view and all that stuff. But uh, absolutely, it's, uh, it's working out well for me as well. Great. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that feedback. Well, it's just a good take. Thanks for taking the initiative because it was, yeah. you know, and I think it probably works better for the town accountant too, because we're doing it, what, every two weeks now. And so it's a more even workflow. Absolutely. Great. 
I think just as a, as a final a follow-up to the financial statement and such, the the planning for next year, usually we start in October. We, we I usually hand out the general calendar for building the budget for the following year, just to, just to keep you on the hot spot, Shelly. Um, however, we don't even have a state budget yet. So this is going to be very interesting how that goes. And then the word coming out of the state right now is, yeah, 22 is going to be awful. So I have a feeling it, I, we're probably going to end up shifting our calendar to be more spring heavy. Um, you know, you, I, I don't, you know, Shelly, I don't have to talk about it, but I'm just kind of letting people know that, you know, we're keeping an eye on what the state is doing and what are they going to do with the final budget? Everybody obviously is still going to one twelfth budget. It doesn't really affect us the way we, we put our budget for level funded and such, but um, the concern is 22 is going to be a difficult year. So um, just letting you know that's coming down and, and next month we'll be kind of putting out the calendar of a schedule of how we'll create our budget. But I think it's going to be, it's going to be a, a kind of a messy year in the sense that that schedule most likely is going to be updated as we go through. But I'm just kind of bringing that up as another thing that's crossed our path as we've, we've been having different meetings with people around the state. Yeah, and like you said, like like Shelly said, uh, you know, she's still waiting to see what the numbers come in for things like once students start getting to school, it's hard to even get a baseline of what 22 is going to look like. There's so much up in the air still. Do Any we, other come? Go ahead. We get a uh, like an enrollment report for the opening of school, or is that sort of you know you can't deal with that yet because of the circumstances? The official enrollment is the October one enrollment, so you'll have that for the October meeting. So October one is when we have to take the official snapshot. That's when you get all the people coming and going, um, and that's the one that we'll be submitting to the state. So we'll share that with you to give you the where we're at with numbers wise. Okay. When we do that, could we get um, the numbers on how many kids are hybrid and how many are remote? I think if we could do that. Ben, you may already have that, right? Do you have that already, Ben? Or no? Yeah, the the exact numbers I, I can, I'd have to look up, but we're at around 55% hybrid, 45% remote. Thanks. Mm -hmm. But we could probably break that even by, by Jessica by grade, you know, so we can see what our, our grade numbers are and see if that yep. changes. Yeah, I have it in another document, um, but it's not tallied in uh, in total. All right. Any other uh, questions on the financials before we uh, move on? All right. Uh, on the agenda is public comment, but we didn't receive any to read aloud. So again, we, we've had issues with uh, public participation in the meetings directly. So for now, at least the policy is if you want to make a public comment, uh, submit it in email. Uh, it's going to the chair, which is still me for, for now until we do a, a reorg unless that changes. Uh, but uh, I'm sure also Donna Hathaway or the uh, administration would field stuff as well for public comment. Um, unfinished business, an update on school reopening. Is that you, Ben, or Darius? So Ben is going to kind of give us a basic overview of how things are going, and then I'll, I'll jump in a little bit with a few things as well. How did remote start off, Ben? So I was unmuting. Uh, the school year is up and running. Um, as you know, we started August 26th with 10 days of PD. Our teachers worked nonstop just to prepare for the remote opening on Thursday, September 10th. So I'm very appreciative of all the efforts that they've made and, and continue to make. Um, so we had two days of remote last week. And then yesterday, we welcomed our first cohort of students into the uh, building. Then next Monday, September 21st, we'll bring in the next wave of students before we finally um, welcome more students in on September 24th. So we're kind of easing it into the school year in terms of the number of kids we are bringing in. Um, the, the key for the school year is remote access, right? And in order for remote learning to occur, there has to be remote access. So a lot of these first few days have been spent on troubleshooting, uh, getting teacher clickable classrooms up and running, providing support to families, setting up email addresses, phone calls, sending emails, so on and so forth. 
So uh, we've really been working hard at just getting families access to the um, to the school year. So that's we're four days in. So there you go. Do you feel like you've got everybody with access at this point? Uh, no, we definitely do not have everyone with access at this point. Um, some families with uh, internet at home issues. Uh, we we have offered the internet cafe for for those families. Um, still, just you know, with the health crisis, some people are choosing to keep their students uh, remote, uh, signed up for remote learning. So we're working out plans with them. And then it's um, the the just the technology piece. So there's a lot of troubleshooting um that uh we're, we're doing with families and we're meeting each family where they're at and helping helping them out where they need to be okay any other questions concerns anything you need from the community substitutes yeah 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 um uh, Nothing from the community at this time. I did, um, in my principal's report, I did uh, I give a shout out to a couple groups that I don't know if this yeah. is the time to do that or um, or if that should happen when the principal's report is written. The principal. I, I will say based on, on what you said already, uh, yeah, big thank you again to, to all of your teachers and staff for uh, making what it was a huge logistical challenge uh, go as smoothly as it has. All right, and I guess that brings us to the uh, anti-racism equality committee's uh, mission statement and goals. Hey, Greg, I'd like to introduce um, a blast from the past for, for Sunderland. Okay, Amanda Mosea, who is a Sunderland graduate of, I mean, I don't know what year that is, but also a Frontier graduate of 2013-ish, maybe. Um, and Amanda has um, has joined our, our committee um, as, in a consultant role to help us um, you know, navigate our mission and goals in direction for our anti-racism and equality um, group. And so she's you know she's with us tonight to kind of give us an overview of where we where we're at at this point in our in our progress. And a lot has a lot has occurred. So Amanda, I'm going to let you take over from there. Hello, everyone. Um, I think I'm Sunderland 2007, if the math checks out from Frontier 2013. <laughs> um, but it's good to be here with you all uh, this evening. So I want to provide some updates about um, what the kind of curriculum and professional development aspects of this larger committee have been doing. So we have um, there are many, many people in this committee, and I have been working very closely with the curriculum and professional development kind of subcommittee groups. Um, so I'm just going to give you some updates on what that's looking like at the elementary levels. Um, so we have had for professional development, that's where I'll start. We've had one professional development session kind of all of the elementary schools together. And then our second one is tomorrow. The first was really just an introduction into why anti-racism work is necessary in this district, despite the fact that it is predominantly, predominantly white school district, we still have many students of color. Um, I was one of them back in the day. And so um, the introductory session was really just a call in to bring everyone in, why this work is necessary, get everyone on the same page. Um, tomorrow's professional development session will be um, introducing two different professional development pathways that teachers and staff can, and administrators can take part in. And so those two different options are uh, white privilege um, and identity and the history of racism. And so the over the course of the, I guess, semester <laughs> is kind of the time frame that I'm sort of looking at it as um, there are going to be eight separate professional development sessions and teachers, staff are going to be meeting in small groups of about 10. 
um, and going through a pre-made structured, I guess, kind of curriculum uh, outline that is includes articles, includes videos, podcasts, discussion questions, and they're focusing on those two separate aspects. So identity and white privilege and history of racism. Um, so people will choose kind of which pathway they want to pursue. Um, and then in that sm in those small groups kind of move along um, the curriculum and sort of expand their understanding um, of these topics and how this applies to this district. Um, those each session, I didn't say this, but those eight sessions are about one hour each. Um, and I've also been working with the curriculum um, committee and they have three separate goals at the elementary level. And the first goal is to create shared vocabulary across different grade bands so that when these discussions get brought up in the classroom, they have developmentally appropriate language to use with the kids. Um, and so that's the first kind of goal. They have different, um, things are broken down to different grade bands. So there's pre-K through two, uh, grades three and four, and then five and six. Um, and then uh, the second goal is to have book recommendations for each grade, five books, five book recommendations where they feature a wide array of diverse protagonists, diverse plot lines, um, things like that to really prompt these conversations in the classroom. And then the third goal, which is much larger and ongoing, is just th thinking about how we can revamp our various curricula to be as inclusive and as honest and up to date as possible. And so that is a much more broad and ongoing goal, uh, as opposed to the other two, which are much more concrete. Um, but it is basically the, the goal of the first two is that people then have the tools that they need to really tackle that third goal. So a lot of work has been done. I have absolutely not been alone in this. <laughs> um, there have been phenomenal teachers um, from Frontier, from all of the district schools who have been incredible cheerleaders for this and have worked so hard. So I, I am the face of it tonight, but I have been in an amazing concert with some incredible people. So it's been, it's been hard work, but it's been very rewarding so far. Um, yeah. And I, I think, I think that's everything. That's everything I wrote down. Um, so if you have questions for me, I'm happy to answer. I'm sorry if this was already explained and I missed it, but um, Amanda, can you tell us what your role is in entering into this? Are you a, a staff member? Are you a volunteer? Are you a consultant? Oh, that is, yourself that is a or great or question. I absolutely skipped over that. <laughs> um, I launched into what we were doing, but did not uh, explain who I am. Um, <laughs> yes, so I um, am a consultant. That's kind of my official role. And I came to that role, uh, I guess, kind of by happenstance. So there was the um, alumni letter that was signed by hundreds of Frontier Union 38 alumni. And I helped in a very small way create that letter. Um, it was basically sent to me, asked if I had anything that I wanted to add. Um, I added maybe two things. So my contribution was minimal, <laughs> but I said, I would love to be a part of the follow-up from this letter. And so from there, I got in touch with some people who were um, one of them who is the one of the co-chair of the anti-racism and equity district-wide committee kelsey crop and she said hey like we would love to have you in on this um what are my qualifications to be a consultant <laughs> you may ask um so i i mean in addition to having been a student of color in this district all the way kindergarten through 12th grade um i 
went to university and I studied racism in contemporary America. So this is my my background, my wheelhouse. Um, and I'm very, very happy to be kind of applying that knowledge to back home in this district. Is it okay to say how nice it is to see an SES graduate who comes off so well presenting herself and so on? It makes <laughs> Sunderland resident, it makes you feel real proud of the school and the people who went here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that means a lot. Thank you. Outstanding. I, just, I mean, Darius, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed to me that right off the bat when after that letter was published that basically you and your whole administration was on board and like, yeah, this is something that's really, you know, it needs to be addressed, but it's also an opportunity for the school district to make some real progress. And that was my sort of sense of the reaction, which I thought was a real positive reaction. And it, have you been finding that you're running into roadblocks? Are you finding I, that? I think what's, what's great about this group is it's gotten a lot of energy that hasn't had to, it's coming from the outside and from the inside. It's kind of a little bit of both. And I think that's really important in order to sustain it. You know, we've made, we've done, we've gone after certain things and, and to try to make some change at Frontier and within the district, but it's how do you sustain that and how do you get, mm -hmm. um, there's so many different, you know, you know um, battling, um, you know, racism at, at the secondary looks different than the elementary. And how do we get both groups together and use the energy as one force? And that's kind of why we did a district wide instead of just by each school, because then you're only as strong as whatever your leadership is in each school. But if we bring the, the community together, um, you know, that's been the idea there. And Amanda's bringing so much energy to that. that that's just mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, in, in, in leadership there as well. And so I think we're just, we're really taking the first steps. I mean, we just kind of created the outline. I gave you guys, I sent you guys the, the mission statement and goals. It kind of gives you, it gives you a nice solid direction of where we have to go. Now the work's before us. Now it's where the kind of the, where the rubber hits, where, where the teachers get involved and then we get the students involved. And then we start making change into our culture and how we do things um, overall. So it is a, it's a longer process. And I think the important thing is it's not, it's not one person driving the process, it's accountability to multiple people in a committee that's bringing it along together. So I think that's that's super important. I do wanna bring up that it was mentioned at the um, Frontier School Committee that there's interest in what can the school committee do to also be educated, um, especially around, you know, a common language, um, you know, how to talk about racism in order to um, be able to deal with racism in our district. And so they asked for me to look to go out and look for what kind of training could be done possibly at the school committee level. So um, I am doing that. And so if I maybe bring something back your way and ask if you want to volunteer to do that, um, either individually or as a group, that'll be, that's your business to decide how that's done. But I'm um, just letting you know that that was brought up at the last meeting as well. So um, again, you know, I think that the whole community kind of wrapping its head around um, how we move forward is, is important. I'd be very interested in doing some of that work at the school committee level. I think more of it never hurts. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I think that's kind of it is a whole. You will also see at the school committee level, you know, obviously I'm on the policy committee. We're going to be looking at changing and updating our policies um, for not just legal language, but language with tone about how we want to address, um, you know, you know, racism and inequality within our district and that kind of thing. So um, you'll be seeing those things popping up as that, those materials get completed and such. So you'll, you'll be throughout the year and, I, and I'm trying to keep it on the agenda so that, that there's accountability in multiple spots. There's accountability as a group to each other. There's also accountability as we report back to school committee, which is also a public meeting about, you know, so people from the public can keep checking in about how we're, it helps keep the the, the train moving um, and to, uh, the, the train of change, I guess you'd say, the, 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 that kind of thing. So that's the game plan. So you probably, you'll see Amanda, maybe see Amanda again. I don't know, we're, you know, we're talking about different ways of how we'll do presentations in the future, but um, this being her special place, I imagine um, she'll want to come back. Yeah, um, don't tell the others, but <laughs> Sunderland's the one. <laughs> um, I will leave my email in the chat in case you all have any further questions. I would be happy to answer kind of offline. Thank you. Amanda. 
Outstanding. Thanks, All Amanda. Right. Oh, yeah, the email there. Thank you. All right. Um, let's see, in that case, uh, update on HVAC repairs is next. <clears throat> yeah, so I threw that on the agenda. When the agenda was created, it was in the middle of our, um, we had HVAC. Um, we basically what we did is we paid we paid our, our, our uh, HVAC company to do an assessment of all all the buildings in the district, and then when it did, um, the report became came out there were problems in or problems in almost every building except one that had flying colors, um, but it had to go back where we had to repair certain things and 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 do that such one that it, this was a costly thing so I wanted to talk to school committee about that because we did invest. Um, just about it was about ten thousand dollars in HVAC repairs to um, to get the building up to what one could call you know code. Um, even though some of the the parameters we're meeting aren't exactly code, but there were recommendations and also recommendations that were put out by the the MTA as minimal air exchanges and that kind of thing. Right now, um, I'm I don't have the Jamrock is who's our service provider has not. Um, given me the final report of every classroom um, assessment. They said the um, the air exchanges have been completed and ventilation work needed to be done. The final report has not been printed by them, but they say the numbers are all above the minimum requirement of 2.0 air exchanges per hour, which was the one, which was one, the one factor of all the different kind of information they were given about fresh air inflow and that kind of thing um, that was important for um, especially staff members to see. So they promised me that all the rooms are above 2.0. Um, I do I am holding the accountability of that report and I'll be sharing that report with the school committee and the association when I get it. Um, they promised that the same in other buildings and, and have delivered. So, you know, we did get Deerfield's report, which was in far worse shape um, from their initial report and they, their, uh, their report came back as such. Um, the library is the one with the, it had the biggest issue where the, the fan, the motor had to be completely replaced. That has been replaced and will be noted in the final report. And then we are also waiting on the um, MERV 13 filters, which should be arriving any day now. And we also um, are installing UV lights into the major um, exchanges, the, the, the larger roof air exchanges. Um, and in fact, uh, Sunderland, that's actually a higher price than some of our other, other buildings because of the amount of air exchanges that we can put UV lights into. Um, and so um, that is probably going to happen at the end of the month into early October because those UV lights have been, you know, there's a demand on those right now. So they've been back ordered. They believe that's when they'll, they'll have them by probably the end of this month. And then it, it, I guess it's a pretty, pretty quick install. So how I'm looking at it is a, from a safety perspective and such, by the time we're closing windows and that kind of stuff, we're going to have the, well, the additional UV lights also help um, do one more layer of protection of um, killing bacteria and such in the air. The, the MERV 13 filters don't do a, a lot, but they do a little and any little thing um, does help. So I just wanted to put that on there because of the, the cost of that. Um, and that we obviously talk about that in the community when that first report came out with some units not working and um, we had to put an exchange unit in the nurse's office as well in Ben's office area was not filtering air out. So that had to be put in as well. Um, did I miss anything else, Ben, within there? Because I kind of gave a quick overview. Um, so I, again, that's why I was on the list. Yep, you, you hit it, uh, nurse's office, my office, library, and air exchanges. Uh, and also the windows, there was some almost $4,000 in window work done, right? To, for, as part of the ventilation project, not Jamrock specifically, but. Yeah, so some of our windows, especially on the south side of the building, um, which we know are kind of in the queue to be replaced uh, for a capital project needed to be serviced with new hardware. Um, one wasn't even opening properly. And then also in one of our preschool classrooms um, that had been converted to a classroom from an art room, did not have an outside window. It had, uh, didn't have a window that opened. It just had, had the glass. So we, we've added that as well. Thanks, Ben. Outstanding. All right. So uh, under new business, or sorry, any question on the HVAC? 
Okay. Um, under new business, uh, we've got a, an emergency policy. So normally, uh, it, getting a policy through is a, a three meeting process, uh, informational discussion, uh, followed by a vote. But uh, under the exigent circumstances of the COVID, it uh, looks like we're going to have to uh, rush through the uh, BEDH or so, yeah, um, public comment. <laughs> So let me explain where we're at at this point, if I can, Greg. So, yeah, so your your policy adoption allows you to dispense of the sequence of um, the readings in emergency in an emergency situation. And I, you know, in this particular would qualify as emergency situation because you want to have public comment at your meetings. Um, what I did is in this again, I consult the attorney and such before doing so is that he said you can put a procedure in place, emergency procedure, which we did tonight. Um, and then we added language to the public comment and I got to tell you other committees have already kind of talked about, can we do more than what this has said? And so I've already been kind of told, and so you don't have to have a re, the repetitive conversation, but um, they've kind of said, they've said that, you know, um, can we do something, you know, basically, let me, let me read where we're at now and then we can talk about that. How about that? In the event that a special or regular meeting of the committee is, is held remotely, the public comments must be submitted in writing at least 24 hours in advance to the chair of the school committee. During the remote meeting, public comments will be shown on screen for viewing or read at the meeting, provided the comments are consistent with the rules and procedures detailed in this policy. So um, the feedback we've got on that, and so that was kind of the emergency one we put into place for our meeting tonight. Um, um, we did check, um, I think the 24 hours, I, I think Jessica sent me a note, does that have to be 24 hours? We can probably make that shorter. The problem is, is you know, is guaranteeing that they get, that the chair gets them. And I, I actually ran into that problem this afternoon where my, where Donna had to go, had to leave early today. And I was like, oh, I, you know, before, you know, I had a call where I said, can you check them one more time just to make sure that we don't have any other comments, you know, you know at four o'clock this afternoon. So I gotta make sure that whatever we put into place, I have multiple safeguards in there. Um, Amherst does something similar to this, but they also have a hotline you can call in. So it's not just only in writing. Um, I, say, I don't want to say a hotline, but a line you can call in um, and leave a message there as well for public comment. Um, there was talk about, can we have a, Google Meet is coming up with new, new uh, updates in October where they may have protections that's going to help us out in this area. So this might be moot in the long run, but I don't want to put all my eggs in that basket because if it isn't there in that kind of protection. In fact, they've already Google Meet. Google did just come out with another thing that says if I kick you out of the meeting, you can't get back in. So that's also a nice little thing. They just did that. They did it as a quick update. Um, you can't get back in unless I invite you back in. So that's another thing they've, they've, they've put some. They've already started to put these safety procedures. So we might be. This might be a really short term thing. However, um, you know the other committee. What they did is they voted this so that we can set up the next meeting and then I'm going to work on trying to get what this could look like. Can we have a, where someone can leave a comment in another place during the meeting? You know, it's obviously it's gotta be for prior to public comment so it can be read for public comment. Um, something that's a little bit more happening that day rather than having people to prepare several days in advance was what I heard. But anyway, it's for you to discuss. It's your, it's your public comment. Um, Remember, public comment was on our list to update anyways. Remember, we were we sent it stuff back to the attorney and then everything got extremely busy and that got put on the back burner too. So this is a policy that we probably are gonna revisit again and again. Um, it is an important policy because it is your, it is your uh, it's our rather um, connection to the public about commenting on our business. So, so Greg, I guess I hand it to you for discussion on what we have here. Yeah. That's our. My my own, I mean, so uh, it has language about 24 hours and uh, the comments are consistent with the rules and procedures. Uh, again, uh, we're definitely not looking to squash uh, anyone's opinions or, or prevent anyone from, from speaking publicly. Uh, I definitely agree that uh, submitting comments 24 hours in advance guarantees that they'll get in. Uh, and, uh, you know, like you say, we'll, we'll try to... Uh, reopen the channel as much as we can as soon as we can but uh yeah anything less than that at this point is running a, a risk 
Um, do we want to take a shot at wordsmithing this live or? Uh, no, I, I guess I'm looking for yeah. your ideas of concerns and I'm, then I'll have, because I'll have it, uh, you know, unless you guys you can do what you want, but I, I think more or less, I'd love to hear your ideas of like, what, what do you think's missing on it? Other ideas of bringing it, you know, um, you know, I had a, a brief exchange with Jessica regarding this, you know, via email about concerns, you know, about trying, you know, we don't really don't want to limit public comment, but we want to make it accessible as we want to make it accessible yeah. as possible without, um, you know, curtailing the business of our meeting by, what happened at that? I mean, the Amherst solution uh, it gives you audio. Uh, I don't know what the technology would be to to pre-record a video thing that would be, you know, essentially the equivalent of, of someone making the comment live. Uh, it's all stuff we could look into uh, in the near term. You know, I, uh, I feel like we're trying to get on the right side of the law in the very short term. But, yeah, I'd be excited for uh, any ability, you know, again, you talk to IT, uh, of people to either leave an audio recording if they chose, or to uh, to record them reading their message in their own you know face and voice. Uh, Jessica, I, I think it could also be an option. I think I think I could be wrong, but I think that Google Meet already um, offers a way that if somebody does submit a comment to us in advance and we can verify their identity, that we could invite them into the meet instead of just you know watching the stream, and we could make it so that they couldn't share that link with other people, so that we wouldn't have any uninvited guests. Um, it, it's because we're in a period where at the national level, lots of people are being disenfranchised from d democratic participation. I would like us to do what we can to make this tool of public comment as accessible to our town as we can, um, both both with trying to invite people in to deliver their own public comment um, and in reducing that 24 hour window, which seems to me like a barrier to participation. Greg, can I just give my- uh, Yeah, by all means, Peter. Um, and, and I really am just gonna talk in a very general sense. Uh, and that is that um, I'd say in the last over the last 12 months or some such period, we've had a uh, significant public uh, input to uh, the committee and committee committee members uh, in regard to obviously the current, you know, what are we going to do for school in the fall and remote versus hybrid and all that. But then prior to that, uh, questions about the union contract and negotiations and stuff. And there was both. Uh, in my mind, I sort of consider public comment to be both what we get directly at a meeting, but also emails that are sent to us, um, generally sent to us where they're sent to all members of the committee. And uh, that to me is, is also public comment. And um, I would just say that in general, um, I have been absolutely, totally, positively impressed by the public comment that we have gotten over this period of time. And I'm talking in terms of those two general issues, which is probably 99% of the public comment we've gotten since I've been on this committee. Um, and I've been impressed by uh, everything, not just the, what was said, but what was said was, you know, certainly impressive. What, regardless of what side of the issue people were coming down on, um, how it was said, how they were written or how they were said. Um, and if they were written uh even you know i'm old-fashioned in this sort of things but the grammar the spelling all this stuff was just man we've got some smart people and some well-educated people writing in contacting our committee okay they've got things to say they say them well they say them respectfully okay and yet they feel passionately about them and i think boy you couldn't ask for anything more and so I take that sort of general sense of how lucky we are to get this, you know, feedback and this input from the members of our community um, and not wanting to do anything to discourage it and wanting to make sure that we uh, we actually acknowledge it and say how much we appreciate it and say how important it is. and. I realized that given the technology and giving problems that, you know, we may have to deal with so on that there may be times that, you know, right, like right now where we have to struggle to figure out exactly what we're going to do. I want to make sure that, at least from my point of view, that the focus is on how do we make sure that the public is both 
invited to comment and welcome to comment and can comment without undue difficulty. Okay. Because all that's important. Okay. And then it's just, again, I mean, the icing on the cake is, boy, we got some great people writing us and talking to us because they really, it makes you feel, it makes you feel like there are a lot of well-educated people around here. Okay. I mean, it's really, I was, I just, I kept opening these emails. It's like, oh man, there's another one. And it's just, you know, I mean, it was just really, really, um, you felt good to be part of this community just because people cared and they expressed themselves so well. So again, I can't fix the details. I don't understand some of this stuff about what you all talking about, but I trust that, you know, whatever you want to do in terms of the details for this meeting and for the next couple of meetings, you know, I'm game, just keep, you know, I hope we keep what I'm talking about, the basic principles intact, which is, we got to preserve this if at all possible. Yeah, I'd like to second the reducing the 24 hour window. And what I really liked that came up was some sort of gatekeeper site while, while technology is trying to catch up with this. So somebody else can be monitoring that and sort of letting people in to comment. That might just be a quick short term fix till we find something else. But I, yeah, definitely second everything that's been said. I don't want to squash public comment in any way. All right. So we have a, a proposal in front of us for a change to the policy. Uh, none of us likes it particularly. It, it was perhaps a stopgap measure uh, for a particular vulnerability uh, that we're hoping to find a better way around as soon as possible. Um, but the, the question remains, uh, do we want to smith the language and vote it? Or I mean, for this, we have, I think we have to do something, because if we don't do anything, uh, then we're bound to the same public comment policies that we were previously. Well, I mean, so I could try to come up with another <laughs> another emergency procedure in which I will include audio recording and a way to invite people to be invited into the meeting for the next one. And then we'll have that language put in for the policy to be voted in. So we go a second meeting with an emergency procedure, I guess. Um, or you do the baseline or you vote something tonight, a baseline Band-Aid for that, and then we update it at the next meeting. You know what I mean? So if the lawyers are okay, it sounds like no one's, uh, no one loves this, right? So uh, if the lawyers are okay, <clears throat> punting this for one more meeting and uh, we'll come back with something that people like possibly a little bit better, you know, research the technology, what's doable. Uh, maybe we push off this particular policy for this meeting. But I probably could get something better. You yeah. Know I mean? You know, I mean, I've had, you know, this is something that we get, I had to turn around on a, you know, literally I had two days to, to kind of get this out for the next reposting of the meeting for the, this is what was done for last Thursday after it happened um, on the Tuesday. So, um, or a little bit more time than that. But the, um, but I could, you know, you could do a baseline and then I could, put a procedure on top of that that allows greater access. But I just don't know what that exactly that procedure is. Like, I don't have, we can try to figure out how to do calling in. Like we thought about, you could do like a Google phone where it allows you to, you can have a Google phone line, but our Google apps don't allow it because they're educational apps. So it has to have a private outside app to do, you know, that kind of stuff. But there's ways to do it. We just, I just, did, I just don't have it mapped out. Um, in the request and invitation, we can serve that. That's simple language, I think. We can just say either make a comment or um, write to the chair for permission, you know, um, um, to be allowed in for public comment. I can try to, and we can troubleshoot it out loud with people who, I think we can, we can figure that out. I'm confident in our abilities. <clears throat> Does that mean we vote on something tonight or do we punt for a meeting?
I think you vote to change and then you then direct me to build a better procedure with more access. And then I bring that back to the next meeting. So therefore you have a little bit something in that position to protect you legally. Um, if I was to suddenly fail at that, you know what I mean? You have the legal background and then, um, you know, you've also tasked me to do that and I'll come back with a procedure um, that allows greater access. Right. So we pass, we, we, we preferably pass this, to, at least in my mind, I think, preferably pass this this evening, but it's only a work in progress. Let, let, let me take a let me take a quick hack at it. Uh, the red section, the, the new inserted section says, in the event that a special or regular meeting of the committee is held uh, remotely, public comments, and then it says must be. I'm going to strike the must be uh, and insert may be limited to uh, comments submitted in writing uh, at least one hour in advance. So that opens the door to be more, but it might be limited to that. So it may be limited to. So my problem, my problem with the one hour, is you're yeah. the second meeting on a stack meeting. I can't yeah. check those emails prior to, unless they're going right to you. Yeah, they're going to you me. I mean? Well, that's what it says, so to the chair. Okay. But right now what? they're going to Donna who's sending them to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But I guess we could give you the password. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We can do that. We can make it happen. All right. Uh, do I have a second? I have a second. Okay. All right. Any further discussion? No? All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Maisie? Yes. Peter? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Greg, yes? Okay. And by all means, bring us something uh, tastier next week. Life will be good. Okay, let's see. Uh, vote to waive the first and second read move on vote policy. EBCFA face coverings. So basically we got so far ahead on that, we didn't actually do that properly. So let me take a little pause. Yeah. You first have to vote to waive your policy for a second okay. reading of the thing. And then you have the vote of that one. So, um, so you first have to, so what I would do is I would say, I would waive for the following three policies because of its emergency nature the reading, um, the two re the two part readings. You do that, then you can do all three without having to do that every single time. I make a motion that we uh, waive the first and second readings of policies BEDH on public comment, EBCFA on face coverings, and IHBHE on remote learning. I second. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jessica. Yes. Maisie. Yes. Peter. Yes. Greg, yes. All right. So it's passed. Unanimous. All right. So now back to the, the face covering. So yeah, basically in front of you, you have a policy um, for face coverings. It, the reason why it is an emergency is that, you know, school will be, um, students are already in the building following this policy. And um, it's good to have it on the books for, um, as fast as possible, but basically the overview is basically explaining what a mask is, who has to wear them, what are the exceptions, exceptions to that, um, and if people are not doing, uh, following the policy. So just kind of a general overview of what we're doing for masks in our buildings. Any questions on that? I it seemed to be thoughtful and contained exceptions potentially where they were appropriate and, and ways to uh, you know litigate that I don't know anyone else have particular concerns with the language of the policy make a motion to uh, approve uh, policy EBCFA face coverings second all right further discussion all right uh, let's see Peter yes. 
Maisie. Yes. Jessica. Yes. Greg. Yes. Okay. E B C F A is passed. And now on to the, the remote learning. This is an MASC policy, basically giving uh, general guidance to remote learning and making sure that we're hitting all the markers of what good good remote learning looks like and making sure that we're reaching all students um, that um, they were doing it in a collaborative approach. They were making sure that um, you know students at high risk um, in special education is also um, being recognized in it. So it's just a long list of bullets, making sure that we're hitting all those markers. Um, I believe we are in engineering. It's a, fall, you know, it's a fallback policy that basically says this is the standard of which we're we're building our programs out of. Um, this was released, I think, and we probably got it in June. It was created in May. Um, Probably could have done it prior to us doing the remote thing, but we were, we were following all the different formats um, from the state. Um, so it's kind of a straightforward policy. Make a motion to approve policy IHBHE remote learning and IHBHE remote learning addendum. Second. Any discussion? All right. Uh, Jessica? Yes. Maisie? Yes. Peter? Yes. And Greg, yes. So that is passed. All right. And vote on the memorandum of agreement for working condition changes for the 2020-21 uh, school year between the Teachers Association, Union 38 Instructional Assistance Association, and the uh, Sunderland School Committee. So this was what we were in executive session having a discussion of, um, and we were gonna come out to vote that when we got interrupted. So we are making that vote this evening. You do have the opportunity to go to executive session again, if you so desire, if you needed further discussion, but I believe we, we as my memory serves that we, we, we not only discussed it, but kind of ready to move forward on it. Yeah, I don't see any need to go to executive session. Um, and I feel like we, we've talked it through pretty well. Uh, motion? Uh, so moved to approve the memorandum agreement, working conditions and changes for the 2020-21 school year between Union 38 Teachers Association, Union 38 and Instructional Assistance Association, and the Sunderland School Committee. Second. All right. Uh, let's see. Maisie. Yes. Peter? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Greg, yes. Unanimous. All right. And I'd like to again thank uh, Superintendent and his staff and uh, the members of the teachers and the IA unions for uh, continuing to work in a collaborative fashion. Uh, I'm sure there are going to be other things that come up and, and we have to keep the same sort of you know, collaborative, positive approach to all of this if we want to get through it. Uh, um, so again, I think you're you're doing it the right way. Yep, we are still meeting. Uh, we had a meeting today to discuss different odds and ends of, you know, all the different, so many different things are changing and making sure that people are um, both safe and equitable and all the things that the association looks out for um, and we look out for as employers. So, yep, we're still working on that. Outstanding. All right. In that case, I guess that uh, moves us to reports. Um, do we have a collaborative report? Ready? All right. So I guess that gets to uh, principal. Ben. Yeah, so I already mentioned um, the work the teachers have done during the 10-day PD uh, PD days. Uh, they were active participants in workshops um, that range from general planning meetings to technology um, and so on and so forth. So it's important to recognize the hard work of our staff. Uh, leading up to the first day of school, we held three family informational sessions for parents and guardians, as, one as, as well as one student informational session for the students of Sunderland Elementary School. 
Uh, during these town hall like meetings, uh, some of the topics uh, discussed included the return to school calendar, synchronous and asynchronous learning, and remote learning. Uh, each session also provided a Q&A. Uh, furthermore, our library media specialist, Rachel Kidder, hosted a technology training for families prior to school starting. Uh, Ms. Kidder regularly goes be above and beyond uh, for our families and staff, and she embodies the true Sunderland spirit. Uh, next up, outdoor learning. Uh, clipboards, camping chairs, and event tents will be showcased as part of our in-person learning program this fall. We are also working with our technology department to set up Wi-Fi access points outside so that students and staff can access and use their laptops and Chromebooks during outdoor learning sessions. And then also uh, community donations. Uh, the Sunderland community regularly provides support to our school. Towards the end of the summer, the Sunderland Women's Club generally, generously donated approximately 330 hand-sewn cloth masks that came in different sizes and designs. Also, they donated close to 150 procedural masks. Um, I would like to thank and recognize this incredibly kind gesture and give the club a heartfelt thank you on behalf of the Sunderland Elementary School. Uh, additionally, we received an extremely large monetary donation from a local Sunderland business. Uh, this silent partner has supported our school in various ways over the years, and we thank them for their donation as the money will go directly towards student programming this school year. Um, I spoke a little bit about this earlier, but from August 26th to September 9th, we had 10 PD days. Last Thursday and Friday were our opening days of school, which was remote for all students. This week, starting yesterday, our pre-K and a handful of other students, uh, we welcomed into the building and the remote for most of the other students. The week of the 21st, we're going to see an increase of in-person programming, still remote for most, and then beginning uh, September 24th and 25th, we're going to bring in the remainder of the hybrid students in the A and B cohorts. So all in all, a very positive start to the school year. Outstanding, any questions? Yeah, the absolute, uh, across the board. And, and it's great to see that there are people, both organizations and, and businesses in the community and and all the work going on within the school. Uh, thank you so much. All right, superintendent report, Darius, you got something for us? I don't report this evening. Outstanding. Uh, well, uh, since we're not doing an executive session, uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I'll make that motion, but before I do, uh, Darius, you, make, you have a driving up to Conway tonight for that meeting? No, nope, I'm just going to click on over. There you go. You know, some things are easier in the new world. Yes. <laughs> anyway, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Maisie? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Peter? Yes. Greg? Yes. All right. We're adjourned.